Welcome to the very first React Native panel. All right. If you have the app, you know a little bit about these people. Well, let's give them a little bit of an opportunity to tell a little bit about this themselves. We're starting off, oh, we got first up here. Mateo, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure, quickly, I'm, uh, I run a small shop out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we do everything React, uh, Node, React Native, and React Web as well. And I've been doing this for quite a long time, almost 20 years writing code. So. Excellent, thank you very much. Round of applause for each person, please. <laughs> very fantastic. Matt Hargett. Uh, my name's Matt, I've been programming for uh, over three decades now. I am older than I look. Collagen works. Um, uh, I'm also an indie musician. Gant was so kind as to play some of my music in the, the loop, which is cool. Uh, I've been with my husband for 17 years. We have a two-year-old little girl, and we live in San Francisco. All right. Sanket <laughs> uh, Hey, guys. I'm Sanket. Uh, you might have seen this logo somewhere. Heard of Native Base? Okay, we are the guys behind that, and we are into open source. Uh, we are about 80 guys back in Bangalore, India, and we are into React Native from like past two years now. Uh, that's it, yeah. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> A man where it's only safe to say his first name, Yanni. Hey, I'm, I'm Yanni. I'm the uh, head of mobile development at Formidable Labs, the company behind Ken Wheeler. Um, <laughs> yes, we employ him. Um, yeah, I, I got lucky enough, like I've been doing web development for 10 years, 12 years, and I got lucky enough to hop on React Native like the day it came out. I've had code in production since 0 0.4. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Right. <laughs> Jennifer Van. Hey y'all, um, in my free time, I'm a rugby player and Olympic weightlifter and a bus driver and an artist and all that stuff. But I got a degree in math and computer science um, and I'm a developer, full stack developer at Capital One. Um, but now I'm a machine learning engineer, kind of finding that space between data visualization um, and design, but also statistics and also doing research on neural networks. Okay. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, Dave Nugent. Hey everybody, uh, my name's Dave. I'm from uh, San Francisco. It's this town a little south of here. Um, I run a conference there called Forward JS that's gonna happen in a couple weeks and I work at a company called Click. Uh, and we facilitate companies making interactive dashboards with uh, HTML and JavaScript. Awesome, okay. <laughs> so we have a pre-selected uh, set of questions that we were working with. These are pretty good. Let's see what happens when our panelists stop being panelists and start being real. We're going to start this one off with yarn or NPM? Yeah, it's like war, right? NPM versus yarn. Okay, so when yarn came out, we started using it the day when it was launched because it solved two main problems. Like, uh, it was fast because it downloaded the packages in parallel. And the second, the log file, we really loved it. And we are sticking to it because NPM 5 is good, which solves both the problems. But still, uh, there's no looking back because Yarn is doing the job, right? So, yeah. Well, just to, I mean, we actually also used Yarn, and I, I agree with everything that Sanket said. But just to provide a counterpoint, I think there is something to be said for using the so called native client for the, for the platform. So the only problem that we've had is that when we work with organizations that has like big teams and it's really hard to enforce the use of Yarn and sometimes you get like really weird um, different dependency resolution me like, you know, mechanisms uh, in the two clients and then there's really hard to track box. So if you want to use Yarn, you should probably try to make it like an organizational um, command. But other than that, Yarn is the balls, yeah. Yeah, like on that point, if you don't have the same version of Yarn, you don't get the same deterministic um, what do you call it, like guarantees. Um, so you really have to get like your whole team on board and make sure that everyone has the exact same one um, or else then NPM 5 um, actually has stronger um, guarantees deterministically, so. I feel like this would have been a different conversation before NPM 5 came out and screwed everybody. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, it, um, they made it the default really fast, 
And so I was, I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, they have time and whatever, and everybody there is nice and smart, and so it's not a matter of skill or whatever. But uh, I think it's a, a very interesting case where um, a lot of people are on latest node, and because you get more ES7 and ES Next features and blah, 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 and then to have kind of NPM5, which I think anyone who did try to use it in earnest can agree was not quite ready for prime time. Um, uh, and now it's kind of, so I was kind of like, oh, you know, NPM's coming along, they know what their problems are, no one's, and they're all smart and they'll, they'll get there. But uh, with NPM5 for me now, I kind of, um, as a, from a technology strategy perspective, I would like to see uh, Yarn succeed more, just so there's less centralization okay. in that one company. It, they, they can still run the registry, and it doesn't impact their business model uh, much, right? Um, Fair. But I, uh, I don't like you all agreeing, so I need to find some other questions. <laughs> uh, all right. Hey, one more thing on that. Um, yeah. So just because we're in a React Native conference, right? Um, so one of the things that if you do library development or multi-repo development or even big monorepos, because uh, React Native Packager doesn't support symlinks, so the extra way that um, NPM5 screws you is that it changes the way the, uh, the local, lo local package path resolution is actually now a symlink, which won't work with the packager. Um, so yeah, and we wrote a tool to solve that called Wackage, but it's broken now too on NPM5, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, flow, TypeScript, or just live free? Um, uh, so uh, I'm a big static analysis nerd. I did a startup in the early 2000s um, that did uh, static analysis of binary code to find exploitable security bugs. Uh, so I, I, have, I have opinions. Um, but 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 uh, what I will say uh, aside from that uh, um, is that um, I had a lot of people complaining about flow, and I was like, well, you know, if you go into a static analysis tool with a reasonable understanding of what it can and can't do, um, like maybe it'll be better. And also, when I would talk to people at meetups and what have you, we tried flow, we hated it, blah blah blah, it gets in my way, blah blah blah, and I'm like, well. You know, people say the same thing about ESLint, where it's like, oh, ESLint or standard JS or whatever. It's like, oh, they found a new thing and now I got to go fix them. And it's like, well, that's what you want it to do. So, um, so in our project, um, we gave Flow a really strong try. Um, and uh, when I was talking to people who hated it, I couldn't dig deep enough. They didn't have the technical knowledge to be able to like explain like, other than like, it sucks, that's all they could do, that's all they could say, and like, so I wanted to find out for myself on a real project, because I, uh, from a static analysis perspective, I think they're doing everything right. It doesn't find all the bugs, but they are very open uh, in their blog posts and stuff about what it does and doesn't do. Um, so we, tr we did try it, and what we found is that, um, so one thing is that Flow actually has hard-coded stuff in it um, to, that kind of ties it to specific versions of React, so if you go to update React Native, or your React app for that, for that matter, and you don't update Flow at the same time, bad news bears. If you go to, um, so those, there's a coupling there that um, I actually found quite shocking that they would have hard-coded stuff in their static analysis tool that ties it to specific versions of the framework. And on top of that, in React Native, they like will, um, if you go from like 42 to 43 to 44 to 45, they are updating Flow because they have to keep flow updated with the same version of React that they're using, which means that I go to update from 44 to, or 42 to 43 to get Flatlist, and now I've got a whole bunch of new flow, flow things, and it's like, all I wanted was Flatlist. Um, why, and now- That's all go, we all want. Right, uh, and now I have to go update all my annotations, and it's not even necessarily that it's finding new bugs, because that would be nice. It's, oh, they changed an annotation, now I have to go update all my annotations. That's not something I want to take on. Um, and so, uh, uh, Anders is uh, great, I'm a big C-sharp fan, Anders uh, who uh, designed TypeScript. The thing I don't like about TypeScript is it's not an ECMA standard, it's, it's, a, it's a single vendor language effectively that compiles to JS. From a technology strategy perspective, I don't like that, but at the same time, um, unless something changes with flow and the way that uh, the coupling that it has, unless it's made more kind of practical, 
I wouldn't recommend anybody use Flow at this point in time in, in, in a production app at scale. So you have to toss it in one hat. Is it TypeScript or live free now? <laughs> All right, somebody else on. Yeah. I, I was just pouncing to respond to whatever you were saying. Um, you know, I, we use Flow quite successfully in a large case scenario. Yes, all those things are true. Like, you know, especially the versioning um, is, is, is a nightmare. Um, and the error messages are really terrible. But, but what I do like about Flow, I uh, like the platonic ideal that it tries to kind of, you know, like express the type system um, is, is far more sound. The inferencing works better. So what I'm kind of doing here uh, is, is that is I'm betting on, on Facebook just like pour money and, and, and you know, resources into it. Um, to solve the, the remaining problem. So that's my kind of strategy to it. And I, but fundamentally, live free is not an option. If you are writing JavaScript without types, you are both irresponsible and, and well, I'm not gonna say the other thing. <laughs> I wanna know if anybody else here is going with live free then. <laughs> yeah, actually we have used Flow and it has worked really well for us. Uh, but uh, after TypeScript 2.1, things have changed and we are going to give uh, TypeScript a try definitely after this year. So like maybe sometimes you want to live free, right? <laughs> like That's it. If you're just picking it up and there's a lot of stuff to learn to begin with and you're just making like something super small, like don't get bogged down. Don't think that you're tied to this like immediately like, "Oh, I I I want to learn React or React Native. I have to learn Redux immediately and I have to learn static types immediately." And I'm, you just get turned off. So, there's one case where you can live free. That's actually yeah. a really that's actually a really good point. And uh, the, the the thing also is like, if you haven't run into one of the things that like I try to do on on the projects that I run is when we have a bug in production, what's the cheapest way we could have found that bug? And sometimes it's static analysis, and sometimes it's we, if we had done test driven development and it got had kept our coverage at ninety eight percent or whatever. And sometimes it's there's no cheap way to have found that bug, right? And so I think it's a really good point is that you can get quite bogged down, it's like, you know, unhinged jaw, insert Volkswagen, uh, you know what I mean? Because it's like, oh, what do I do? Like, and people can get paralyzed, basically, because it can be yeah. an intimidating stack when all they really need to do is just open up the console and the browser and fuck around uh, to get started. No, absolutely, for small stuff, you don't, you can live free, you don't need types. But I mean, I think, I think you know, in, in investment, investment into um, tooling like static analysis is something that, you know, like you need to, you need to invest in and, and budget as part of, you know, like the cost of building like a large scale system. And you know, a, lot, a lot of the answers that we're probably talking about here today are like sort of large scale production kind of scenarios where, you know, where I still hold that types are, are basically mandatory. Um, and then, you know, getting to like other languages um, than TypeScript and Flow, you know, other compiled to JavaScript languages, I think that's where new solutions may emerge. Um, I think for us, where, where Flow has worked, uh, we use it on a large scale project, is uh, on the data layer and the business layer part of it. And I, I don't have any experience on, with TypeScript, but my understanding is that TypeScript is a sort of all or nothing uh, buy in. And whereas Flow, you can actually have, um, you know, you have incremental type of checks, um, which goes, you know, uh, to Jennifer's point, which was, uh, you know, you can you can do this phasing gradual as opposed to, you know, buying the farm. So. All right, so we'll move on to uh, some next questions. And then also, I think that if anybody wants to talk, you know, this is a great opportunity. If you have your opinion also afterward, um, they'll be all out there uh, during the coffee session as well. Okay, guys, what's the editor of choice? Microsoft Word. <laughs> It looks like you're trying to write a program. <laughs> QBasic? QBasic? QBasic. <laughs> okay, so VS Code for me with uh, its integrated uh, debugger, which I use it a lot, and uh, along with maybe test-driven development uh, of Jest plus debugger, and obviously tools like Prettier, and ESLint with Prettier, again, those things are like my default standard these days. Too serious? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I migrated from Sublime to Atom, and I'm just sick of, you know, going forward. So I think VS Code looks amazing. I definitely gonna be my probably next editor to try. But you know, once you get comfortable in something, you're productive. Does it really matter? I mean, tell that to to a Vim user. Yeah. So there's this new. There's this <laughs> He's new awfully quiet right, right in the corner. Okay. And it's it's only three characters. It's the only three characters you'll ever need. It's Vim, right? Do you like syntax highlighting? You don't need to have it. You don't, you don't. 
And sometimes you get into like some weird command mode and things will just start to happen, you know? And maybe it's not what you intended, but maybe it's what you needed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move, yeah? Uh, so just, I, I want to know, like, vi so you, you said no syntax highlighting. Does that mean you're not even a Vim user, you're a actually, VI user? It's actually just VI, yeah. Holy what? Shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah. I don't yeah. like the colors. We need to get, call, like, uh, Miriam Webster so we can put his picture in her Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I try to use every editor that I uh, can, like, so every time I start a new project, I'll be like, well, I'm going to make the rounds with, uh, with WebStorm and with, you know, these different um, uh, VS Code. Yeah, yeah, so I try, so when we started the, the React Native uh, project that I'm on now uh, last year, I tried uh, VS Code on Mac, it crashed twice, and I said it's not ready yet, and I, then I tried uh, WebStorm, and I just tried a bunch of other things, as I find problems, uh, I file bugs with uh, in JetBrains and their tracker for WebStorm stuff, uh, file uh, VS Code issues, and then I just kind of come back around A, just to have the neuroplasticity. I don't want to be, I, I work hard to try not to be one of those inflexible people where it's like my productivity begins and ends with my editor or my keyboard or my, or my whatever, um, but also the way that, um, as someone who's been working for a while, is the way you help these things move forward is by trying out a lot of stuff. Everything has good ideas, and then you go file issues or tell other vendors like, hey, you should have this feature that they have, and try to just help everything kind of move, move forward. Because these yeah. things go in cycles where a tool will be good, and it'll have a couple bad releases, or not, not bad, but suboptimal ones for you, and then it'll get better and, and stuff like that, so. Excellent, yeah, if you try VS Code and you have any problems, uh, we know exactly where you are sitting, Rob, so it works out perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's converted me over to VS Code, so fair enough. All right, let's, uh, let's open up navigation. What are we using for navigation? Well, that's a mess. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, React Navigation uh, is, is amazing. Um, all the people at, at, at Expo, Brent, you know, all, all of you working on it, uh, thank you so much. You have made our lives so much better. <laughs> um, and what I really hope to see is get similar level of polish and kind of standardization over the native hybrid um, navigation. So I mean, there are solutions out right now, but from Wix and from, from Airbnb, uh, which are great. Um, but you know, for the brownfield stuff that we work, we've had to roll our own uh, so far because we haven't been able to integrate them into the architectures of the apps where we're working in. So pure JavaScript, React navigation, hands down, I don't think there's much argument for that. And I would hope if somebody would have one. Um, but yeah, the native, native one is still the problem to be solved. We agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I also agree. <laughs> so actually, let me just add, like, we have been uh, using React Native Router Flux. Uh, I mean, initially we were using that right after trying, like, React Default Navigator. And uh, recently, like, React Navigation has been, like, quite performant, and it has solved most of the problems. So we are sticking to that right now. Oh, actually, the microphone was just rolling. I needed to catch it. Um, no, um, navigation is really easy if you don't use it. Just make a big, just no navigation. So another roll your own. Interactive dashboards, yeah, just a big interactive dashboard. So, so uh, Dave and I have, uh, uh, so in, in the, the, the uh, next generation BlueJeans uh, video client, um, there is always full bleed video of the camera from the time the app starts. But even before you sign in, there's like an opacity on top of that full bleed video where you can type in your name and stuff. And so what was interesting, and it's a desktop app, so it's not a mobile app where you have panels and slide items and stuff like that. And so what we found is that we literally couldn't use navigation because that video component never goes away. It is always there. And so um, that's not a knock against navigation or anything like that, but uh, just to highlight that there are some legit UX, um, and, and it's a good UX, there's, there's nothing wrong with the UX either, but um, not, depending on the application, but definitely all these infinite scroll apps and stuff like that, absolutely, it makes sense. But we, I think we did end up using navigation anyways just to get, because uh, it was the kind of easiest way to get deep linking 
um, so that we could launch from browser and launch the desktop app right into the meeting. Um, but as far as like you're on this page and then you're on this page and this typical kind of mobile navigation just didn't apply to our application. Uh, and not just because it's a desktop application, uh, if we uh, take this UX to mobile, it will be the same where it, it's kind of like, so it's kind of like one, it's one screen where we add and remove controls, but that video component never goes away. And it was actually a, um, not a rude awakening, but when we were kind of like uh, making the walking skeleton of the app and we were using navigation, we then had to kind of remove it um, because it's like, oh, the video stops and then starts when we go from here to here. It's like, oh no, we can't do that. Um, so uh, so the, depending on the application, navigate, like a, like a single page application, like Dave's dashboards, for instance, uh, you don't need it. Uh, gotcha, yeah. All right, uh, stop agreeing, y'all. Okay, let's see, let's just get some. MobX, MobX State Tree, Redux, Redux Logic, Flux, Freactal, just set state. <laughs> All right, um, so I mean, I very much understand the kind of um, the backlash against high-level tools like Redux recently in the Twitterverse and the just use set state movement. Um, because you know, like a lot of these tools are super heavy. Um, Redux wasn't really invented to make like small things very quickly. It was it was made to make really complicated things manageable. Um, and I think the problem is that people kind of use you know um, like heavier tools when they when they always don't need to. Uh, what I would say though, in defense of, of Redux, is that when you don't look at it necessarily as a as a state management solution, but you look at it just basically like a like an interop layer where different disconnected middleware can operate on shared state. Like, uh, you know, Redux middleware, you can do one to store your um, state into disk and one for dev tools and, you know, one for side effects. It's actually a really powerful thing. And the most important thing in, in, in the state management area, in my opinion, whatever you use, is that it forces you to think about it. Like back in the day, building like Angular apps or whatever, it was, it was, it was you know, impossible to manage the state because you weren't actually like thinking about it in a structured way. So MobX State Tree, which is the new kind of a little bit more Redux style, heavier uh, process, you know, way of interacting with MobX, is is really good direction because it forces you to think more about the the overall shape of your store. So whatever you use, I, I don't know if it matters that much. I recommend Redux because of stability and the interop, but happy to uh, happy to have me called out. Yeah. Yeah, plus, it works really well with Redux offline. I hear so. <laughs> yeah. So actually. Uh, it really actually boils down to uh, the use case, I would say, because initially uh, we were, uh, in the last project which we were building, uh, it was a complex ap application where we had a lot of connected components, and we started with Redux, and what happened is that uh, all the components had their own map state to props, and every dispatch was hitting all the components on the page, which actually made the page slower. So in that scenario, Mobux actually worked better for us. And I'm really looking for like mobile state tree, which actually gives uh, better traceability and undo redo feature and predictability of immutable data. Uh, so I think uh, mobile state tree might be a good thing uh, coming down the future. Uh, we ended up using uh, Redux Observable in our application and uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, Yanni's point, um, uh, we, it was necessary for our application because of how many different kind of channels of information that we have. So SIP, uh, uh, SIP used use for the audio and video signaling, plus a web socket, plus REST, plus the user interaction, plus the Google Calendar and every other like uh, kind of integration that we have. And um, all those things kind of all work together and interact with each other. Um, and so the, to deliver there's a lot of complexity to deliver a, a simple, seamless user experience for that, but the state management um, was quite hairy and highly asynchronous. Um, and so uh, observables was the kind of, um, seemed to be the best way, and we had pretty good luck with it, um, uh, and uh, using epics and, and observables and stuff like that. But what I would say is that if you don't have that kind of highly complex, multiplexed events, 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 so many events, if, if, you, if you don't have that, I, observables is probably overkill, and Ben Lesh says the same thing. 
He's like, this is a big hammer for a certain kind of problem, and if you don't have that problem, you probably shouldn't take on the overhead in the, in the complexity. Uh, I mean, one, one thing, uh, Eric Baer's talk earlier today about GraphQL, um, that's kind of like an interesting tie-in because um, you know a lot of these clients for GraphQL, uh, Relay, or Apollo, I mean, essentially, you know, deprecate the need to the large parts of state management, and especially a lot of the kind of like data fetching part that is complicated. So what I would look at is 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 Apollo. I mean, I if you are able to use GraphQL, then you know Apollo can be the state management solution. Period. Um, they, they are doing some more work on 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 you know getting like your local state sort of seamlessly integrated in it, but underneath it's just a Redux, I think. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Very nice. What about uh, some of our panelists who haven't had a chance. Um, no, I, pr I pretty much agree with Matt with um, what he said. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, we're using Redux. Uh, we're using Redux, and uh, we're using set state still. I, I like to use set state when it's uh, a, um, a local uh, state that needs to be like a UI type of thing. So there, there's something to be said there with, with set state. It's not a, a completely useless um, thing. Um, and uh, but yeah, we, we haven't had. The multiplex, uh, you know, channels that you had to to kind of merge and, and use observables um, in both large projects that I've done in React Native. So uh, Redux uh, and, uh, and and Thunk uh, work just fine. And I, I do like um, I'm a big fan of the um, the kind of the functional aspect of JavaScript in general. And and Redux, uh, you know, takes a lot of those paradigms. Uh, you know, at heart, so I, I quite enjoy coding in that. Well said, well said. Okay, so transpiling is getting popular. We have ClojureScript, PureScript. A lot of people are interested in Reason. Have any of you any opinions on that? I like Reason. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Okay, um, so uh, back to Brent's talk from earlier. Um, the community is really good. Um, so uh, I think that that doesn't get enough spotlight or enough incentivization um, to either join that community or to maintain it. Uh, so I want to just like spotlight that right now. Um, the fact that they are trying, I think they just came out with Create Reason React app. And they're actively working on bindings um, and the fact that you can contact any of them, they'll get back to you within a few hours, and they're lo actively looking for community volunteers to help add those documentation commits to show examples of how to use it, um, anything to like onboard anyone else, um, just try to troubleshoot. I, I think it's awesome. So. Very nice. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to like transpilers, uh, I prefer using uh, my custom Babel plugins for little hacks like. Uh, sometimes you import a lot of things from a uh, library, uh, which actually downloads all of them. And it just like, if you use like import X comma Y comma Z from something, it actually downloads everything, but you're actually just consuming X, Y, Z. So for such cases, I write little hacks so that it imports only X, Y, Z uh, with Babel plugin, transpiles that into three different import statements. So I, I like such little hacks using Babel. So that's the thing, yeah. Okay, maybe uh, we uh, pick up uh, testing. See if, uh, is there one way to do it? And I'm not just talking Jest or however, but I'm talking about testing all the way through Appium, testing the app, smoke test, live free. <laughs> yeah, I'm with Ram, we, we all pretend to test. <laughs> yeah, we all agree. <laughs> Do you want like a series? Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, I was, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so we talked about having a safety net of static analysis uh, or even ESLint, which can help actually find some kinds of bugs, like unused variables uh, can often like be like, that's not what you meant to do. Like you thought you were assigning to something, you're just assigning to something else. Um, so there's that. We have uh, some jest tests. And then we have some enzyme tests, uh, which is why we're still on React Native 42, because everything after 42, if you have uh, enzyme tests, they won't run on anything after 42, and no one's fixed that yet. Um, so then we have enzyme tests, and then um, we were using a thing called uh, Winium to, because uh, ours is a React Native Windows application. We've tried Appium a couple of times, but the WinApp driver um, 
is broken, and I'm actually actively working right now to make an open source uh, React Native test app, basically, to demonstrate for that team at Microsoft how uh, WinApp driver is broken. Um, but uh, so basically, um, try to have like a bunch of really fast feedback loops that kind of get slower and slower as you uh, as you kind of go out. So that inner developer loop is really fast. Um, but then, like I said, every time, uh, and not just on React or JavaScript projects, but C sharp, C plus plus, assembly language projects as well. Bug in the field. What's the cheapest way we could have found that? And sometimes it's static analysis, but uh, in my experience, uh, oftentimes it's you know we were we were TDDing um, strictly enough um, or or stuff like that. I don't think these things are mutually exclusive at all. Um, I'm in a little bit of a different. Um, uh, my typical use case is, is a little bit different, and my opinions might be a little bit different, because I'm not a consultant who does the first three months of a project over and over and over again. I've, I've like been on projects for multi-year and having to grow a team and scale a team around it, and so um, uh, there's no kind of one strategy, and there's no kind of, sometimes there's not even kind of one tool. Like in the case of React, certain kinds of shallow rendering are faster or slower. There's certain kinds of like components you can't shallow render using one tool, so you use a different tool to shallow render. Um, I think just being pragmatic is, is key. Yeah, good. Yeah, so uh, I'm a big fan of test-driven development, uh, and it goes really well with React and React Native. Uh, we use Jest, and along with that, uh, we have integration with VS Code, wherein like uh, you have the debugger uh, panel uh, or the tab, uh, wherein it just integrates really well. So whenever we are writing a piece of code, we write a dot, dot test.js file to test that, and I execute that personally like right inside VS Code without actually uh, hitting the browser or, or the uh, simulator. So you just get the entire test there itself, and VS Code has a very nice feature wherein you can just uh, add the breakpoints right inside there, and you get all the object uh, console and all those things right inside your editor, So which is really cool. Since I alluded that we don't test, maybe I should clarify. <laughs> uh, just, just you know, to, to be sure. Uh, so, okay, so unit testing, uh, your program logic, um, you know, your 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 normal kind of JavaScript oper operation, your Redux state, your 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 state transitions, super valuable. Uh, we do that a lot, just um, and just regular assertions. Um, I also think UI testing, using things like Appium, or we'd be using Calabash on the Xamarin Test Cloud, which is like the same stack under um, Mobile Center. Super useful. What I'm not convinced, though, is the usefulness of the UI level uh, testing either with Enzyme or with snapshot tests. We've done both, um, but I've never really found it to be that valuable. It's a lot of really brittle tests that break easily and don't really catch the errors, in, in my opinion. Do we have time? Like, can I go on? Uh, do you all mind if we go just a little bit over? Everybody enjoying themselves? Yeah, OK, yeah. So, this is the real stuff. These are the conversations you're all having, but we're just having on stage. <laughs> what worked for you? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, going at, yeah, about snapshot testing using JS or Enzyme. Uh, even I used to think, like, it doesn't work because taking a snapshot, what does it mean? Uh, but when you're upgrading the version of your dependencies, like React Native going from 40 to 41, you can just match the same snapshot, and it just works, and you can be safe that, OK, it, it is working. The test is going fine. So in that case, a snapshot is really cool. Yes, I agree. Uh, <laughs> uh, wait, 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 wait. But, 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 but back to the static type checking. Like, uh, like a lot of those kind of like uh, accidental breakages, refactoring breakages, dependency update breakages are actually can be caught by a type system, which is a lot cheaper to write than tests. But anyway, just. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> a fight to the death. Good shout, good shout, Tanket. <laughs> I just want to say, yo mama. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, failed ta table flip. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, is there an emoji for that? A failed table flip? Someone, someone get on that. Some pixel artist needs to make a failed table flip emoji. Um, uh, one thing I was going to say uh, that I would really love to see in the JavaScript tooling is in Visual Studio 2017, and, and, and I think this was in one of the JetBrains IDEs as well, they have a thing in Visual Studio 2017 for C Sharp and probably the other .NET languages as well, where it, when you run your unit tests in the IDE and it measures the code coverage, 
it knows what code yeah. is covered by what tests. And then when you go to modify a line, it knows the exact subset of the tests to run. And yeah. this is not a new thing, this is not a new strategy, and if you're on a large project with thousands of tests or whatever, this is a common strategy that people have done with you know, Python scripts or Perl scripts or whatever, but it's in the IDE and it's literally just running the test in the background as you type because it knows that map of coverage of implementation code to whatever. Nice. It is really hot shit. <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it really is. It's awesome inner developer loop stuff. Yeah. And I, uh, I haven't seen that in any of the um, kind of uh, React or React Native or even JavaScript tooling. I would, yeah. I would love to see it, but also I would love for everybody to see it because it, it's, uh, uh, if you're on a project for a long time and you have more and more and more tests and you can do lots of things to parallelize and make them fast, but it always just, you just get to a point where I need the coverage because it's finding bugs. I can't parallelize it more. It just takes longer and longer. So the, the next thing to do is to kind of like shard the test in a smart way. I'd love to see uh, React IDE or tooling or whatever that, that does that. Um, it's, it's really cool. Cool. All right, uh, we're a little bit over time. So I'm gonna take our very last and I think probably the most important question. And I'm going to have each person answer it, please. Or just say I don't feel like answering it. That's fine as well. But uh, I want you to, after this, everybody has the app, you have their Twitter accounts, right? What I want you to do is I want you to tweet just a little bit about why you think this is the biggest challenge in React Native. But rather than having it here, we'll, this will engage the conversation. People will tweet you back who are here at the conference, and this will start the conversation for solving some of the biggest challenges. Uh, it's a little bit in the vein of what you know, Brent was talking about, but it's starting right today which I think is the best time to start. So I think that each and every one of you should uh, take just a moment, one sentence, and then we'll close the panel out and get back to our regularly scheduled program. But Mateo, would you like to start? Uh, biggest what was the challenge. Question? Biggest challenge? Listening. Um, <laughs> observables. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, the biggest challenge that we are facing, or we, we seem to be, uh, we have to worry about with React Native. One sentence, and then please tweet about it, uh, and then everybody here has their Twitter account, so you can start that conversation with us. Uh, <clears throat> I would say parity. Parity with uh, issues that I found that don't happen in one platform, and for some reason uh, happen on another one, you have to go deep deep into either the framework or the native side of things, so. Very nice. Parity. That's a very good one. Um, as, uh, as someone who is uh, on a uh, longer term product team, um, who are now stuck on React Native 42, uh, because React Native 43 updated React 16, and React 16 is it's not a quality problem, but they broke tooling for anybody who is doing uh, a, a, uh, uh, shallow render render testing, which means that you are stuck until it's fixed. And some some people might say, well, it's open source, just fix it, right? <laughs> uh, just like that. Exactly like this, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, and that's true, um, and definitely on every project that I've been on since, uh, you know, 1994, when we were uh, running an ISP on Linux, you get out of open source what you put into it. Uh, I, I really believe that in the course of my career over across many different technologies and whatever, I found it to be true. But the, the biggest challenge is uh, basically um, internal Facebook commits going right into GitHub, raining on the parade uh, of everybody. It get, then it gets released and you're like, can that please be reverted? Because this is really gonna screw things up for a lot of people and um, when those, when their internal priorities and stuff that works for them doesn't align with the rest of the community and the people who are trying to build a business using this, using this technology stack, um, frowny face. Yeah. Uh, I like how you kept it to 144 characters by ending sorry, with sorry. a frowny face. <laughs> Thank it. Yeah, so uh, I would say the performance of React Native apps, uh, mainly the communication over the bridge, if we can fix that, then we can do like a lot of performant applications, like we can also do games and all those things. Uh, we won't have to worry about navigation again, because if the bridge is good enough and the, uh, like it's, 
like the performance is really good over the bridge, then we can just go ahead and do a lot of crazy things. Yeah. Very nice. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is, is in the community like of, of React Native to be able to have honest conversations, like say things like Matt just said, but also like we web developers, you know, we, we really want this thing to work, so we're rosy-eyed about things, you know, we, we gloss over like obvious deficiencies. Most native developers don't want to do it because they feel threatened about, you know, like their kind of like, you know, their, their way of working. Um, and, and we're just not having like a, like a conversations where people sit at the same table and try to make the best possible product using the best possible technology. We're all just like holding agendas. Um, and I think that's something we should fix. Excellent. Jennifer? Hey, uh, so I think there are three things that I really want uh, to be addressed. One of them um, is accessibility. Um, so the idea that when we build apps or anything that people use that we keep all people in mind. Um, so the fact that if you have some sort of inability to read something or um, to hear something, uh, that doesn't seem like it's really thought about in the design process. Um, I think another part of it, uh, the community part, is uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, so there's been a bunch said about that. I implore you to take a look at Twitter. It's all over there. Um, and the last one is security. Um, so uh, the idea that there can be authenticate, unauthenticated messages sent through IPC to the kernel in Android is crazy to me. Um, and I don't think that it's addressed at all. Uh, so I think those are the three things that uh, I would like more of a spotlight on and I think uh, are rife for um, development. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drop the mic, we need tape. Oh, thank you. They're very expensive, I won't drop it. <laughs> um, I think our biggest problem is just adoption. Um, we have this you know, HTML JavaScript product and if our customers would use React Native to build their apps, that would really help us out. Uh, and so just convincing these large enterprise customers that this is a, a viable option, that's probably our biggest roadblock right now. Awesome. Um, and, and if anybody does follow me on Twitter, I just realized that like 15 minutes before the panel, I tweeted that we were all backstage like arguing over TypeScript and it was getting heated and we were like strangling each other and two of us were dead and I was using my MacBook as a shield. So sometimes when I tweet things, they're not entirely true. <laughs> All right, well, everybody, did you enjoy it? Let's give everybody a warm welcome. Thank you so much for our panelists.